significant difference actually in addition to the canal 3B map or the canal map is that one, the canal map adjusts the population, get, makes, makes a more significant adjustment in population to even out the DVA or to minimize the deviations population wise. Correct. The canal map also, um, it, it also really addresses the community of concern item with regards to trying to um, bring that canal community and um, uh, Latin uh, Spanish speaking community mm -hmm. more together. It also um, mimics the San Rafael city district lines for at least their district one. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Is that correct? Correct. That's Whereas correct. the yeah. minimal change map is primarily it's it's pri its primary utility is about population, just numbers. Mm -hmm. Okay. Slight adjustments. All right. Yeah. Thank you. And the other question I had for Kristen, I believe you mentioned with even with the canal map, there were a couple other minor changes, and I thought maybe you could mention those. I believe a, a, a precinct in Larkspur actually shifts from District yeah. Four to Two. Yeah, and you can actually see that um, right here on, on the screen. So again, the red dotted line is the current district boundaries and the shaded are the proposed. Um, and this has to do with actually where the census block itself moved. Um, so this is, this is why this particular block right here. Um, and if we look at it, I think it's in terms of population, no, that's not right. We have to look at the block. Um, in terms of population, it's either, it's not a significant number of people. Let's look at those blocks. And let's pull up just so we can see if this affects any number of people, not streets. We want to see census block. For those, those that are listening, that's across from Redwood High School in Larkspur. Yeah, and I there there may be little to no population here. The block has zero population that I'm looking at right now. This block here. So population number is zero. So some of this is just, you know, we have to, we don't ideally we will draw district boundaries that follow the current census boundaries. And the reason for that is because the population data that we have is connected to those census block geographies. So if we are splitting a census block, then we can't ensure that we're using accurate population data. So um, this really, this change here may not even move any voters. Any questions about that? Supervisor Mullen, Actually, just go ahead. A, yeah, I think I'm. I the what I would love to see in the next round of maps is actually streets. It's or it's hard to see some of this, and not all these maps seem to be from the same. Anyway, a little more detail on the maps, and and what I'd like to see is not current district lines, proposed district lines, and then in 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 major streets. It would just help orient, I think, if that's possible. Next go round. Yeah, so that's possible right now on the interactive review map. Okay, thank you. Yeah, so you can zoom in down to down to the street level. Supervisor the PDF Mullen. for a county, it's very difficult to, to display that. Supervisor Moulton Peters. Yeah, thank you. So um, I'm noticing that a lot of the maps that have been submitted um, actually do um, unite all of Mill Valley. Uh, and Dennis and I haven't had a chance to talk about this, but given the public input on that, I, I would be interested in uh, us continuing to look at that if that works with other schemes that you're considering for balancing the population of uh, uh, District 4. I also wanted to note that there is a map that includes all of Mill Valley in District 4, which I thought was also quite interesting. <laughs> But anyway, I, I'd uh, be interested in, in having some version of that brought back to us in the future mm -hmm. to keep 94941 together to see what that looks like. 
Would you like to pull up that map right now so everyone can see it? Well, Those there's maps? there's actually several of them, Dennis, and I didn't look at them all closely to know what the, the real distinction is. Mm. Uh, perhaps that's something I could mm. pursue with staff in the intervening week or two. Sounds good. Mm -hmm. Anything else, Dan, uh, before we go to the public? For public um, I don't think it's his time, Supervisor. Okay. We're going to open this up to the public now, and uh, I think I'll allow three minutes and anyone in the chamber can speak first. If you'd line up at the podium and maintain your distance, you're welcome to take your face covering off when you're speaking, if you like. Welcome, Paul. Oh. I run a public affairs firm based in San Rafael. I previously served on both the San Rafael City Council and the San Rafael Board of Education. I'm appearing today on behalf of Canal Alliance. I worked with Canal Alliance in 2018, providing testimony in the San Rafael district creation process, the city of San Rafael, which resulted in the adopted San Rafael council district map that's included in your staff report. That district, which includes the Lincoln Avenue corridor and really the area along Woodland, that's kind of the heart of our interest, is the rental housing along Woodland Avenue at the base of Bret Hart and Cal Park Hill. Um, and, and it recognized a real community of interest with the canal neighborhood. We greatly appreciate that your team has included this option as the NDC canal map, and we would urge that you, that you uh, give direction to staff for that as your base final map, whatever other adjustments you choose to make, like 94941. This would recognize the community of interest testimony if you received and better align your district boundaries with the city of San Rafael. And I'll just note, I know you received a number of bits of public comment. I would note the comment you received from Jim Schutz, the city manager of the city of San Rafael, who was there when the district maps were drawn for the city elections. I'm the one who submitted map 73599. I'm wondering if we could pull that up for just a minute and make it a little easier to explain the, the changes that I'm recommending. Kristen, could you do that, please? Yeah. And while, the, while that's coming up, um, what I'm attempting to do is to incorporate the line drawing that was done by San Rafael City Schools when they created the trustee areas. And if you could zoom in on just on this central San Rafael portion, I can point out where this really varies from the um, NDC canal map. The district included a portion of the Montecito neighborhood uh, Happy Valley, Montecito neighborhood around San Rafael High School that includes a similar Spanish-speaking population living in multifamily rental housing. And that's the, it, you see, you can see the spine of Lincoln Avenue going up and just sort of below and to the right of that. There, it includes an area above, it's kind of around San Rafael High School, Montecito Shopping Center. And the major change to that map really from the NDC Canal map is that particular neighborhood so that you see in the looking at that map the Lincoln Avenue corridor is not quite as much of a spine at the base above the San Rafael Canal it's a little fatter and that's it includes that one neighborhood and what this would do is not was create an overlay that matches district the boundary of district 4 in, in central San Rafael not only to the school district not only to the city rather but to the school district as well could I have a 30 seconds more yeah go ahead thank you so this does, I attempted to demonstrate this could be done with population balance. And so what I did to get that population balance was shifted some of Gerstel Park into District 1, which created a need to make some other changes in District 2. I want to be clear, my client, the Canal Alliance, is not advocating any particular adjustment that would be required. Our interest is including the Montecito Happy Valley neighborhood, which is um, similar, a similar community of interest to what you've already done with the NDC canal map. We appreciate your previous direction to ensure fair representation of Spanish-speaking communities in Marin, and especially in the canal area of San Rafael and similar Spanish-speaking communities with more renters in multifamily housing, higher level of immigrants, and lower household incomes. Again, we urge you to use the NDC canal map as a base moving forward, but to consider expanding to include the area around San Rafael High School consistent with that direction for fair representation of Spanish-speaking communities in Marin County. Thank you very much for your time. Thanks. Anyone else in the chamber like to speak on this item? <coughs> Seeing none, Al, 
Can we go to our, our Zoom audience and see who would like to address the board on this item? Yes, our first speaker is Clayton Smith. Please unmute and you have the option to share video. It's my opinion that this fetish with equal populations per district doesn't serve the public interest, but actually is, a, is potentially injurious to it and a potential source of anti-democratic political chicanery and divisiveness. By geography, neighborhood, city, easy identification, and compactness, Marin is distinctly and clearly divided into five communities. We have the West County, we have Novato, we have San Rafael, the Ross Valley, and the Richardson's Bay community of Southern Marin. Given the outsized importance of West Marin to the quality of life in the entire county, I think most people in this county would be comfortable if they also had an outsized uh, voting power. And I don't think there would be much objection to it. Um, I also think that if the United States can tolerate Rhode Island having two senators and also California only having two senators, I think that this uh, issue of population uh, is something that should be set aside for the actual uh, public interest. And given this, I also think that there must be somewhere in the law uh, an exception uh, to this particular fetish of population equality available so that we would have exceptions to this rule. Right now I'm looking at this uh, and I'm looking at the few people actually coming forward to comment. And it reinforces the fact that I don't really trust this process and wonder what uh, legal processes of appeal are going to be available if the final uh, redistricting um, adoption reflects corruption that will be harmful to the people of Marin. And in particular, for the district I am in, District 3, it's time to bring Homestead Valley home to the district and retain Mill Valley 94941 Salito, Strawberry, Tiburon, Belvedere, or at least most of Tiburon, the west side of it, all in one compact contiguous area. I think it would be shameful to begin chopping up our district and handing pieces of it off to um, District 4 or other districts in order to serve this, this, uh, this fetish about population equality. We have an interest here of our own in Southern Marin, and we should respect the fact that we are a distinct community down here with our own distinct interests. Thank you. Thank you, Clayton. Al, anyone else? Yes, the next speaker is Linda Jackson. Please unmute and you have the option to share video. Good afternoon, Board of Supervisors. I'm here uh, to share some thoughts about how the San Rafael City Schools prepared its map and the considerations that we made. I am a member of the San Rafael City Schools Board of Education. I'm not speaking for them, but I'm just going to share the story of that, just those decisions um, about Montecito and how we included that neighborhood with the area, we call them areas in school districts, for um, of the canal neighborhood and some uh, surrounding neighborhoods with that, including Lincoln Avenue. So if you think of the canal area, uh, the canal waterway, it's a historic and iconic feature in this part of the city. It's how San Rafael was originally uh, founded as a mission city in the early 1800s. The canal waterway doesn't belong just to the neighborhood named canal along the south, southern border, but it's also 
belongs, if you will, to Montecito Happy Valley, where I lived for 20 years and where my neighbors and I enjoyed the canal waterway from the north side. Uh, you included Lincoln Avenue, which has many of the same population and uh, built features of a diverse neighborhood with single family homes and apartments, a diverse population, but a lot of um, immigrant families, uh, love of being close to central San Rafael and high transit usage. So there's a lot of common interests that lead us to want to include Montecito with the uh, district that has the canal neighborhood. In addition, the families in the canal and the families in Montecito, the families along Lincoln Avenue, all feed, go to Davidson, they go to San Rafael High School, they share a common interest there. Um, so I, I wanted to give you a few more considerations for including the, the Montecito neighborhood, Montecito Happy Valley neighborhood in the um, district uh, that has West Marin and the canal neighborhood. Thank you very much. The next speaker is Omar Carrera. Carrera, please unmute and you have the option to share video. Good afternoon, Board of Supervisors. Thank you for the space to talk about this important issue. Uh, my name is Omar Carrera. I'm the CEO of Canal Alliance. When the city of San Rafael switched to district-based election systems, we look our community to ensure their interests the, the interest were represented. There is a community of interest that extends beyond the Canal neighborhood. Compared to the rest of San Rafael and most of Marin County, this community has a higher percentage of Spanish speakers, has a lower household income, and are predominantly renters and multifamily housing. Currently, this community sits at the intersection of three different supervisor districts, making it harder to organize and represent at the county level. Putting this community of interest into District 4 We'll give, them, we'll give them a common representative and let them speak together with a larger voice. It will also align county districts with city and school boundaries, making it easier for the community to have consistent representation and making government collaboration more efficient and effective. We thank you for the draft NDC canal map and recognize that it is a big step in the right direction by aligning county boundaries with city of San Rafael districts. We ask you to go further and include the neighborhood around San Rafael High School to match the school trustees area as well. As you consider how to draft your maps for the next 10 years, we urge you to take this community into consideration and not rely on outdated assumptions that leave our community isolated and divided. Thank you. The next speaker is Zachary Grigi. Please unmute and you have the option to share video. Zachary, you must unmute your device as well. My, uh, my apologies. Uh, my name is Zachary Grigi. I am a student at UC Irvine. I'm the creator of uh, MapCRG. I really just kind of wanted to echo some of the testing that was given earlier. Uh, I created the map for San Rafael City Schools that was ultimately adopted, and I do agree with Trustee Jackson's comments. Uh, and I also support moving Homestead back in with Mill Valley. You'll notice that Map CRG does attempt to do that, and I do intend to address the uh, I, uh, the comments regarding unifying the canal neighborhood in uh, a district in a single district. I apologize for being so flustered that it's a, I kind of plan to do this at the very last minute. Uh, but I really hope that you will take those two comments into consideration, moving Homestead back into District 3 and unifying uh, what is currently Council District 1 into District 4. Thank you very much. The next speaker is Eva. Please unmute. Thanks so much. Um, can you hear me okay? Yes. Thank you. I was surprised to hear the suggestion um, that West Marin have more voting power. 
um, because of its enormous importance to the rest of the county, um, it does seem like we've seen um, very little concern for canal residents in terms of their importance to the entire county. Um, these people do an enormous amount of what's called essential labor, and um, they probably get the least benefit out of the county, and they've they've had the least amount of political representation, um, as you can tell just from looking at the composition of the Board of Supervisors. Um, and it concerns me that they may have even less of a voice um, because of the opportunity zone um, that's been designated in the canal district. So we're going to see an increasing level of displacement due to the gentrification um, in that area. And it just seems to fit a pattern where we, um, we make some small segregated space for a particular population in a particular area when they are of use to us as laborers. So if we think about Marin City uh, during the war effort, um, that was critical and essential labor. And that was how we had any sort of a black population in the county. When the war ended and we considered their labor no longer essential, um, you know, the covenants were enforced um, even more strictly and no job openings were made available. And it, it really is a pattern that I think we're going to see in the canal district after the, the fruits of the labor have been squeezed out of the Latino population. Um, they would not have been politically enfranchised at any point um, during this critical period. And now um, we are seeing with the Opportunity Zone that they will be gentrified out of their own neighborhood. And in all this time, neither of these communities were given any political power in the county. Quite the opposite, uh, they were frequently subjected to disproportionate uh, racial arrests, uh, disproportionate arrests um, by local law enforcement, which you can see from the 32 years of arrest uh, data that I was able to retrieve from the district attorney. And um, it seems a bit too little too late, but if something can be done to mitigate that, it should be done. Thank you. Yes, Senator Rodani, there are no additional speakers in the queue. Thank you, Al. I'm gonna bring it back to the board. Brother Conley, you have additional questions? I, I have a follow-up question, and this could either go to the team or to Mr. Cohen, just so we're clear on what we're talking about. So Montecito Happy Valley is not included in City of San Rafael District 1. Is that true? Yeah. Yeah, so that district was specifically created to be a canal center district and it extended up to Lincoln um, because of uh, a Spanish-speaking community of interest. So I understand that that neighborhood may be included in a school district which needed to find more population. So there were probably a variety of reasons for including it. I'm more intrigued actually by that city of San Rafael district one alignment and how that may create a possible change on the southern flank of our district one because i think once we start including other neighborhoods that's even further reduction in uh county district one population um secondly i think that neighborhood is kind of at the confluence of a bunch of different neighborhoods including dominican so i think for intellectual clarity if you will my view would be to stick with the city of San Rafael uh, District 1 alignment. That leads me to say I am open to that. Um, I think based on the, uh, and, and certainly we could canvas Happy Valley, Montecito more, uh, dig deeper on that, but I don't think we can just conclude because it's included in the school district that that um, necessarily um, aligns with what we're talking about. Um, the Nevada one as well, looks like that, it, we're calling it a minimal change. Um, again, 
brings the overall percentage a little bit more in alignment. The canal alternative is appealing because we go all the way from 9.18 down to 2.65. That's pretty good. And, and D1 still maintains a healthy population. Um, so, Dan, I guess going to you, Kristen, what are you looking for us to do? I mean, kind of say, yeah, these three alternatives look good going forward. Let's have another round of conversations or where are we kind of at at this point? Go ahead, Dan. Yeah, thank you, Supervisor. And, um, you know, Kristen, I'll look to you as well if you want to chime in. Um, I think bringing to your board today three different options, um, no change, minimal change in Novato and Canal, um, largely mirroring San Rafael District 1. Um, what we're looking to do is to reduce that universe to bring back to your board on December 7th for consideration of a potentially final map. And it seems like there um, is testimony and um, interest among your board with regard to map B as I'm hearing it, but I do want to hear more from the rest of your board members. And we can work with the demographer to see what some of the other changes might um, look like. Um, we consciously did consider the Montecito Valley or Montecito Happy Valley area, but we did not include it in our map B because it is already you know, not included in the most recent 2018 city map. Um, but that said, I think what we would appreciate is direction from your board on what to come back with. And thus far, it sounds like um, the NDC map B and also looking at um, the Mill Valley area, the 94941 and, you know, possibly trying to find a way to um, bring Mill Valley and um, the Homestead Valley together. Um, so that's why I'm hearing suggestions for two maps um, and open to hearing what the rest of your board might we'll, look like. We'll ask the rest of the board to check in and make recommendations. Um, yeah, do you want to do it next? Excuse me. Go ahead. No, you can go ahead. Yeah. Um, the Let's talk about the changes mm -hmm. in Nevada, which sound pretty benign but let's mm -hmm. go talk about it huh. <laughs> um, you said one was was uh, changing um, Indian Valley for the West Nevada Go I mean West going west is that correct I, I think the proposal for a map C, the minimal change, is to somewhat increase um, District 4 population by uh, moving a little bit further east in that Indian Valley area, yes. And it would have a minimal population change. Sounds like a couple of percent deviation. And who, who would get those, the, the extra ones? The District 4. District 4, four right. Okay, right. okay. Um, anything, I mean, I'm, I'm fine to look at that. What else did we talk about? Was, it, was that about it? I think that, w and Kristen, correct me if I'm wrong, I think that was it with regard to the Map C minimal change. Mm -hmm. It was just um, another alternative for your board, keeping in mind that, you know, one alternative was no change. Right. Another alternative was the canal, which would mitigate us down to 2.65, I think, mm -hmm. I think it was. And then um, as an alternative or in lieu of that, if your board wanted even more minimal change, then this map C minimal change option um, would incorporate the Indian Valley area into district four and accomplish 2%. Wow. So it may be more change than what your board is looking for to do both the canal and Novato, mm -hmm. but um, you know, we would look to your board for feedback on that. Okay, great, thank you. Anything else? And that's it. Okay. Stephanie, would you like to make some recommendations? Uh, Dan has covered them in his comments. Okay. Thank you. Supervisor Rice. Yeah, thank you. And uh, Christine, I hadn't realized that I could actually zoom in on these maps online. It's very cool. So um, I, um, I really, I like the direction of, try, of trying to mimic um, those district San Rafael, the San Rafael district lines, especially towards being more inclusive of the, um, our, our Spanish-speaking communities and the and the canal community generally. I do think it's worth looking at um, the map three seven three five nine nine as um, commented on by by Paul Cohen, 
with regards to that Montecito Happy Valley and, and the school district boundaries. And I mm -hmm. think a deeper dive into those census tracts would you know, potentially help make the case or not whether to include it. Um, that said, um, I don't, I, I wouldn't be supportive so much of, um, of splitting off part of Gerstle Park if I, as I look at the streets that are really what's being proposed in that map, 73599, kind of splits the Gerstle Park neighborhood up. And, and that is a fairly cohesive community. They have their neighborhood association. They do a lot of stuff together. So uh, that would just be my comment there. It is a, um, a neighborhood that's, uh, that I think thinks of itself as one. Um, but I am open to um, looking at what you've come up with. And yeah, didn't, wouldn't you know it, as you narrow things down, you actually get more, more input. So yeah. yep. anyway, thank you. Those are my comments. Yeah, thank you, Supervisor. <clears throat> and Dan, I would just add that from my perspective, uh, staying pat and keeping the districts as they are is not acceptable. That's mm -hmm. 2010 and 11 mm -hmm. sort of decision making where you're, mm -hmm. you're just sort of staying pat. Um, also, the shift in Novato is similar. I think that's mm -hmm. following the old rules, just looking at population primarily, and you're just shifting seats around there, mm -hmm. shifting population around. So that really doesn't make a lot of sense. I do appreciate the presentation by staff of the, can, of the canal area uh, map. I think that starts to address a lot of the issues that we're, we're facing around population, around communities of interest. Um, and I think it does a decent job of balancing the population and driving that deviation number down really pretty low. Mm -hmm. um, I, and so I'm kind of happy with that map. And it does align, as Supervisor Conley says, with District 1 San Rafael, which has kind of been requested also. Mm -hmm. But I also, uh, in the next version, since we should have another map to look at, I'd be open to looking at that alternative, uh, you know, including Montecito and Happy Valley in that District 4. But I think that's going to trigger uh, some other changes because then District 1 is going to be short of population. Maybe, uh, you know, so there might be uh, triggering some other changes that are necessary. And coming from the fact that we didn't want a lot of changes, I think we should keep that in mind as we look at that, mm -hmm. that map and that additional change. But I'm open to it. I understand the rationale around it. But, but I also am thinking that being cohesive with district, the, district, the council district in San Rafael, in my mind, is probably <coughs> more important than expanding the, uh, the boundaries of District 4 at this time. So, so I think that's enough direction for you. Mm -hmm at this point yeah so it is going to be critical to do that deeper dive right. yep. though mm -hmm. and because i think a lot of thought was put into that city council mm -hmm. district and, and as, as stephanie mentioned and you already mentioned you know that look at southern marin um, as, a, as a as a whole i think right. um i think that'd be worthwhile looking at that um mm -hmm. i think there may be again other issues that brings up that causes more changes so mm -hmm. I'd, I'd be want to know more about that sure okay Go ahead. Yeah. Like ten years ago, um, the it was it was uh, uh, the parcel are is is four, and uh, so to get it that rounded up, we said well in in Nevada's the highest, so they t I took they took three thousand out mm -hmm. of of uh, that mm -hmm. and to put it from uh, put it to to chat to uh, the um, fourth. Fourth district. So um, I, now I guess we might be moving some back. Or <laughs> interesting. <laughs> okay. So thank you. I think you have your direction. Anything else that you need, Dan? No, I appreciate that, supervisors. I think we'll work on this with our consultants and come back with probably a map one, and then a map two A and a map two B okay. um, <laughs> for December seventh. Okay. <laughs> that seems to be the process. So thank you. <laughs> thank you and very good much. Good comments, Board. everyone. Appreciate the public comment. Thank you. So we can um, take a short recess, I think. We don't start till 3 on the next item. We're about 20 minutes. Okay. So please return at 3 o'clock. Thank you. Okay. Mm -hmm. Oh, hey, <laughs>
Okay. Save it here.
Felipe, maybe you could uh, invite in the planning staff that's going to be addressing us, please. It looks like we're getting ready to go when you are, Felipe. Just let me know. Thank you. Okay. So good afternoon. We're uh, reconvening the Marin County Board of Supervisors for um, November 9th, and this item is item <coughs> 3 o'clock item, which is the consideration of the O'Donnell Financial Group LLC Master Plan Amendment and Design Review at 150 Shoreline Highway, Mill Valley. And we're looking to planning staff to make a presentation, and then we'll go to the applicant. Tom Lai, would you like to kick this off? Yes, I'm happy to. Good afternoon, President Rodoni and members of the Board of Supervisors. I am Tom Lai with the Community Development Agency. The application before you is a proposed master plan amendment and design review. Um, this is a project that requires your board approval. The Planning Commission did vote and submitted its advisory recommendation to the board uh, to deny the application. Uh, Manny Barricat, the project planner, will next provide you with a short overview of the project and discuss some of the issues. And then at the end of the presentation, Manny, myself, our environmental planning manager, Rachel Reed, and our planning manager, Jeremy Kajarian, will be available to answer questions as for County Council regarding this recommendation, uh, in, as well as staff, the staff report and the possible alternative course of action. So with that, um, I want to introduce Manny Barricade, our senior planner assigned to this case. Good. Uh, can you hear me? But my camera is off. Yes, we can hear you, Manny. Good. Great. Uh, let me share my screen. Good afternoon. Uh, good afternoon, members of uh, board members, as well as members of the public. The project before the board today involves a master plan amendment, a design review, and the certification of a mitigated negative declaration. As Tom just stated, under the Marin County Development Code, because this project involves a master plan amendment, the Board of Supervisors is the decision making body. The Planning Commission serves as an advisory, in an advisory role. The project, uh, just a way of background, the project site is located at 150 Shoreline Highway. It's within the Howard Johnson Master Plan area, which was, which was first adopted in 1969 and has been amended over the years. It has a mix of uses allowed on the site. The project site was designated as a gas station and was used as a gas station until 1994. It has been vacant since 1994. Uh, the site the site cleanup was completed completed in 1990 and 1996 and as was used as a storage yard, yard as um, recently as last year the project the project involves construction of a two-story mixed-use building with 10 residential units on the ground floor and 10, 11 hotel rooms on the second floor the unit sizes Layouts, overall design for both residential units and hotel rooms are similar, comparable, similar or somewhat comparable. The application was submitted under the state density bonus law. As such, the project proposes to set aside two of the 10 residential units to very low income households. The two very low income households within the project qualify to satisfy the county's inclusionary, house, inclusionary housing requirements. Additionally, the, these two units qualify the project for state density bonus. Projects that qualify for state density bonus law may take advantage of the benefits provided in the state density bonus law. These benefits include, amongst others, increase in floor area ratio, um, concessions, waivers, as well as number of uh, reductions in development standards. In short, concessions typically involve financial measures, changes in use, or modification to development or zoning standards that would result in actual project cost reduction. Waivers, on the other hand, involve reduction of development standards such as height, setback, parking, parking requirements, and other similar zoning requirements 
in order to accommodate the project. As a state density bonus project, the applicant has requested five waivers. These include to exceed the floor area ratio from 35% to approximate 45%, to exceed the height limit from 25 feet to 30 feet, to reduce windows and fenestration from 25% to 20% on the east elevation only, to reduce tree canopies from 25% to 5%, to reduce open space from 1,000 square foot that will be required for the residential component to zero, and to reduce required residential parking spaces from 12 spaces to eight spaces. Just um, a brief background on how we got to this point. Uh, the, county, the county received a master plan and, and a design review amendment application in November of 2018. After reviewing the, app, the application next month in December, the county uh, deemed the application incomplete and provided the applicant with a list of items to correct and technical studies required in order to complete our review process. Typically, an applicant is given 30 days to respond. In this uh, case, given the magnitude of applicant requirements, we, gave, we provided the applicant with 60 days to respond. The applicant requ requested um, the extension up to 120 days, to 60 day extension. So we granted them the extension and the application was submit submitted um, in July, and I'm sorry, in June of 2019. The resubmitted application was missing almost all of the technical studies that staff required or requests requested and the application was deemed incomplete. It took almost a, um, in total, the application was deemed incomplete four times, and we expired the application in October of 2019 due to lack of progress by the applicant. The applicant resubmitted in November of 2019, and, when, and the application was deemed complete in February 2020, almost 15 months after the application process, the first app, the application was first submitted. While the application progress was being reviewed by county staff, uh, the TAM Design Review Board also reviewed the application four times. Throughout the review process, the TAM Design Review Board expressed, res expressed reservations about the increase in floor area ratio, increase in heights, and raised concerns about design compatibility. Although the TAM Design Review Board, alt board ultimately found the design acceptable, it found the project was inconsistent with the master plan, master plan and recommended that it the application be denied. On September of uh, this year, the Planning Commission reviewed the application and found that the residential component of the project is identical to the hotel rooms. The Commission found the fact that the proposed residential floor plan size unit and layout represent a typical design for a hotel room, uh, the representatives of hotel rooms and not a residential units. Further, further, the commission found that the residential units can easily be converted to hotel rooms. For these reasons, the commission uh, voted to recommend adoption of the certification of the environmental and the mitigated negative declaration and recommended that the project be denied. Staff recommends um, the planning commission sustain the, the, the board sustain the planning commission's recommendation to certify the mitigated negative declaration and deny the project. Alternatively, the project, uh, the board could approve the project, certify the mitigated negative declaration and also approve the project as an alternative uh, decision. Um, that will stop my presentation at this point. And if you have any questions for me, if not, uh, for other planning staff. Thank you, Manny. Any questions of, of Manny or other staff? Manny, did any of your other staff need to present anything? I know Rachel was there and a couple others. Uh, they're here to answer any questions. I would also recognize members of the, part, the Department of Public Works. If you have any questions, they're here. Thank you. Supervisor Moulton Peters. Thank you. A couple of questions, um, Manny, if I could. Could you um, could you um, confirm the uh, the density bonus 
uh, that's been allocated here, and there had been some discussion about uh, the application to hotel facilities versus residential, but just confirmed the density bonus and the, um, the additional units that allowed. And then also speak to the Housing Accountability Act uh, that I is in play here, too. Um, I will address the first question and I will defer to County Council on the Housing Accountability Act. I think they can address it much better than I. Uh, in terms of the state density bonus, uh, because the project sets aside or provides uh, two units at a very low um, income threshold, they're, they're qualified to receive up to 50% residential floor area or additional residential floor area, 50% increase above the otherwise maximum allowable. And on top of that, they're um, eligible to receive additional 20% for the commercial or the hotel components, as long as they provide uh, set aside two units for very low income households. Uh, based on these two factors on our calculation, the project complies with the state density bonus law in terms of floor area ratio. In fact, uh, they're not built into the maximum they could have. They're leaving, leaving some floor area, both under residential and under resident commercial floor area. Uh, one thing I would also point out um, in terms of the state density bonus law is that in order to deny uh, an application under the state density bonus law, there is a higher threshold, finding threshold that, have to, that has to be made. And that is that the board will have to need to make a finding that the requested waivers will result will will result in specific adverse um, impact or cause public health or safety concerns, or would be contrary to law, or um, cause harm to the environment, or um, cause harm to historical property or resources, which we don't think it is the case in in this application. Okay, and then legal counsel will speak to the, um, the Housing Accountability Act, and then I do have um, another two questions. Uh, thank you, uh, uh, Supervisor Moulton Peters. Um, yes, the the determination of whether or not this project is subject to the Housing Accountability Act rises and falls with the determination of whether or not it is a residential project. Um, the uh, staff has uh, indicated to your board that there is a residential component, which the um, planning commission questioned, but that is staff's recommendation. And because of that, the Housing Accountability Act does apply to the project. The heightened standards for uh, denial based strictly on objective standards would apply and uh, any uh, fines and penalties apl applicable to improper denial of a housing project would also apply. Brian, uh, while you're there, I wonder if you could comment also, there was a concern at the Planning Commission meeting about uh, the hotel portion, excuse me, the residential portion being converted to uh, hotel use. And uh, my understanding is there, there's a way to address this with a, uh, a condition of approval with a housing, uh, affordable housing agreement. You, can you speak sure. to that or would that be uh, Tom Lai? Yeah, I, I, I can talk to about that. Um, so the uh, alternative recommendation that is before your board, uh, as listed in the staff report, is to do something which is very customary in a, a housing development project like this, is to provide a specific condition of approval that relates to what the affordable housing agreement will say about the future of the, the project. And um, my view is that your board can guard against any concern that the project would be converted to extended stay hotel or hotel rather than residential studios by having a term in that housing affordable housing agreement that um, requires that the residential use stay residential in perpetuity. So that is the alternative recommendation before your board. And then at, at a future time, if, uh, if there was interest, okay. No, I'm not going to, I was going to ask about future down the road, if any conversion was wanted, then it would need to come back to uh, to this board or, or it would be in perpetuity, I guess is what you said. 
Uh, yes, uh, the, the affordable housing agreement is always subject to revision and change and is always governed by whatever uh, housing laws are in force and effect at the time it is up for uh, modification. Okay, thank you for that. And then my last question is either for uh, Manny or for Tom, and that is um, the, the community plan, I just wanted to clarify, um, ha has for, uh, since its existence, um, designated this, this area multi-residential and bus business serving commercial. Is that the case? It, that is the case. Okay, thank you. Those are my questions. Supervisor Wright. Thank you. Um, first, a question. Is the applicant be going to be presenting? Yeah. Okay, so actually some of my questions may be answered um, through that. I guess I have one question for Manny, and that's about the parking. Um, and I think I heard you say in the in your presentation um, that, um, what, eight, you said eight, um, the, there was a parking waiver or reduction that was allowed and you specified, I think, specifically for the residential parking, but can you speak to the overall parking that's part of the project? So, certainly, so the project as presently present, um, before you includes 20 parking spaces, eight of which will be uh, restricted for, residential, for the residential use and the rest will be for the commercial use. The reason the applicants have uh, asked for a waiver for residential a portion of parking is because it, it easily meets the waiver requirements. Uh, one could argue um, the waiver could also apply to commercial components, but I'm not aware it's possible. But to eliminate that argument, the applicants simply requested that the B way we waive uh, reduce the residential parking requirement from 12 to the actual parking requirement, county parking requirements. Uh, Tyler Bylaw from DPW is president. No, no, I'm good. Thank you for that. I may have questions after okay. I hear from the applicant. Any questions of our staff? I was just wondering if Manny or Tom, you could define for me extended stay and what is there's a definition that we use for that? Because I think of extended, the reason I'm asking the question, I think of extended stay as providing literally short term housing for probably people that come and work for short time, time frames <coughs> and things like that. So I just wonder if we have an official official uh, recognition of what we mean and what we uh, what extended stay means to well, that an extended stay hotel could offer guests for durations of less than 30 days however I think this issue is more pressing for the rent residential rental units where uh, tenants um, would be uh, re would be required to have um, lease terms of 30 days or more uh, because that is no longer short term it's a long term rental stay I hope that clear that yeah. answers the question, Supervisor. Yep, thank you. President Rodoni, yeah. may I ask one more yeah. question? Thank you. Uh, Tom, I wanted to uh, ask our staff what we know about the occurrence of flooding in the area. That we, we know this is near the Manzanita parking ride, and just um, if you could tell us what, what's known about that and access to, to the uh, site. Well, I, I can start and maybe hand it off to our public works um, engineer, Tyler um, or Manny. I know the site has been, you know, subject to uh, king tides and the interchange has flooded. I know this um, from having worked on past projects in that area. Uh, the site is in a FEMA uh, flood zone, but the building itself will be required to meet the minimum um, finished floor mm -hmm. elevations required by the FEMA program. Um, Flooding does occur, as you know, we've seen um, over the news every year. It seems like, um, and then the environmental document for the project, um, I believe, does address uh, the flooding hazards associated with the site. And I believe the um, the the writer of the document uh, is also in the panel, uh, and may may wish to uh, uh, provide more information ar around uh, around that hazard. Also, Supervisors, um, Rachel Reed, Environmental Planning Manager, I can briefly address kind of how CEQA approaches the issue of sea level rise and climate change, if that would be helpful. 
I, I do think public works would, would be knowledgeable in terms of kind of factually what's happening there with, with flooding. But um, just to give you an overview, since it came up in comments on the negative declaration and then the planning commission and your board may, may additionally have, have some concerns about it, but CEQA has a pretty narrow lens when it comes to the issue of sea level rise. And it's not to diminish the importance of the critical um, problem, but it's just to say that as of now, CEQA is not the mechanism by which to address the problem of climate change and sea level rise. Um, the approach to sea level rise for CEQA is established in some seminal court cases, um, notably the Biona wetlands case um, from 2011, where it stands for the proposition that the purpose of CEQA is to analyze the impacts of the project on the environment, not the environment on the project. And thus, this was later reinforced with a California Supreme Court case decision, um, the California Building Association versus the Bay Area Air Quality Management District in 2015. And there the court held that if the project exacerbates an existing hazard, then you would evaluate the impacts of sea level rise. So it's kind of, that's, that's the narrow niche. And we found with the O'Donnell project, and this is um, described in the initial study, NAGDEC, as well as the response to comments that this project indeed, it does not induce or exas exacerbate regional sea level rise. So, you know, sea level rise, it's, it's a planning issue. It's a zoning issue. It's not really addressed right now through CEQA. And then in terms of climate change, it seems that addressing um, climate change is best through kind of regional adaptation plans and programs, which as you know, the county is uh, participating in. And so I will, I, I will kind of defer over to Tyler if he wants to give any comments from Public Works. Al, can Hello, you... Hello, uh, is everybody able to hear me? Yeah. Go ahead. Good? Okay. Um, I just make a one quick comment regarding the uh, the FEMA requirements for this particular project. Um, uh, in regarding the flooding that happens in this area, um, it is mapped as a flood zone. It's it's located in an AE flood zone um, that was um, that was produced by FEMA. Um, there's a base flood elevation um, about ten feet. Uh, which is based off the NAV D88 datum. Um, currently on the site where the project will be located, uh, the existing grade is at 10 feet NAV D88, um, and the structure itself will be elevated a foot above um, existing, a uh, foot above that base flood elevation uh, to accommodate the flooding that happens in the area. Um, and so, in regards to the design of the project, it does meet all FEMA requirements. Thank you. Yep. Okay. So we're going to allow the applicant now to actually make a presentation. Uh, and do you need any assistance with PowerPoint or anything? Or oh, you might need it. Hello. Hello. Okay. Uh, my name is Daniel Shador. I'm the project manager for O'Donnell Financial, and I've also worked uh, there for many years. My experience is that I am the I am the operator of two hotels in Sausalito, and I also manage apartments in Sausalito. Um, as you know, Ma uh, 150 Shoreline is an approved gas station site. In 2014, O'Donnell Financial asked me to look for an office building for them. Uh, we looked at, at 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 the site, and at that point, we tried to put a new office building which would have served our mortgage services. Uh, the, the, the project in 2014 was submitted. In 2016, it was rejected because the county required 25% housing, which did not work for the office project. The county then designated the site as a dispensary site for marijuana. We had several groups come to us, and at that point, O'Donnell Financial no longer had interest in the building. And so we entertained a contract with a dispensary site, and they spent two years trying to get a dispensary as one of the, the prime sites. I then went to Tom Lai, and I asked Tom, I said, what do I do with this site? Uh, he says, well, the primary use of the site has to be tourist serving commercial. And he said, short of that, then you have your apartment element. And this is how we came about this hybrid model of, of extended stay and, and apartments. Um, 
The 150 shoreline fills a need for short-term transition housing and affordable workforce housing. The, loca the location is well suited next to public transportation, bike pass, and the Manzanita parking lot with the airporter and the technology bus up. Most people don't know that there's actually tech buses that run through there and there's lots of young engineers that need housing. Um, I can share that just because I, I deal with the, with, with the market on a regular basis. And uh, in, the last, uh, in, in the last month, I've seen an influx of people returning to San Francisco to work and asking for housing. The man managing apartment rentals and lease, ma managing apartment rentals with lease agreements of 30 days more, or more and short-term rentals via Airbnb and VRBO is very manageable. The two uses complement each other and are done in a very different manner. TOT taxes are required to be paid on all, on all hotels and there's regulations submitting those TOT tax forms on a monthly basis. To address parking, as a hotel operator, I can verify many hotel guests arrive with no cars. They come via, uh, door, uh, what is it, uh, Uber and Lyft on a regular basis. Um, affordable renters often do not have a car. Both hotel guests and apartment renters are ge generally leave their units during the day when house cleaning may occur. 20 car spaces for 21 units is a very manageable number. To address the flooding issue and the king tide, I grew up in Mill Valley uh, my whole life, been here. I know the issue, the, the, the shoreline exit shuts down both on and off ramp, but generally speaking, the site generally will always have access to get, go out the back door through Miller. And it, yes, you have traffic and it is, it is a problem, but our building sits three feet above any other building in the master plan in, the, in that area. So we're, we're in much better shape than any other building there, which includes a 200 room hotel, the, flood, the new floodwater restaurant, the office buildings around us, which many people actually live in. Um, to summarize, I, the converting of an approved gas station site on the freeway corridor for housing is a community benefit. Um, I'd just like to add that planning, the Planning Commission spent a great deal of time working with me on the project to try to come make this work. Their initial recommendation to Planning Commission was for approval, and the process was derailed because of this issue with not knowing how to manage a hotel room versus an apartment unit, which is a, it, it, I understand how the confusion could be perceived, but it is a, it, it's not an issue. It, it's, it's just one is a lease agreement and one is a reservation system and they're managed very differently. Uh, I thank you for your time and any questions? So any questions of Dan about the project? Yep. Go ahead, yeah. Thank you very much for being here, and, and I did listen to the Planning Commission hearing, and um, so I have more detail, but I, there was a couple things that didn't come up there that and haven't come up here yet. So um, I can't tell from the plans, but in the parking that uh, as planned is some of it, is any of it dedicated for, do you have EV charging available there? Is that built into the plans? Uh, you know, we, we, the plan, the plan is, in, is basically the design review set, and so I think, you know, the architect is on, can, can uh, zoom in. Um, but the plan was to have like uh, was to have uh, bike rentals on site. Uh, we talked about even zip cars, uh, cert certainly a charging station. The only issue with a charging station is it may restrict other members from using the, the, the parking space. So when you're trying to utilize a parking space on a regular basis, it, the EV site, which you'll often see in malls nowadays, is the EV sites are empty, and everybody else and the and the and everybody's fighting for all the other parking. So I don't know. We didn't address EV specifically, but what I would tell you is that if you go to the um, to, to the Marin City Shopping Mall, they have a Tesla charging site there, and it's got maybe 20 charging charging stations open at any given time. Right. So so I I guess I, I'd say these things, and maybe your architect knows. I would I think for the residential, it would make sense to at least have one or two of those spots with some dedicated charging. If, if, you, if you are segregating residential parking from the hotel parking as planned, um, I just I think that makes sense and it should be level two charging. I don't know that we have code that requires that yet, um, but I, would, I think I would ask that you build that into your project. I don't know if we can require it. I think it's really important. Okay. And I do think that what we understand about um, if you are, if you're, tenants, if you're residents, if they're going off to work, they may not have the ability to charge when they're at work. So to be able to have actually in a multifamily project dedicate um, charging on site, it's really something we need to start requiring, frankly, everywhere. So I'm just putting that out there and, and maybe your architect can address that later. I'm not saying every, so every spot, yeah. but 
Um, my other question had to do with, let's see, I, oh, you were talking about, and this is where the Planning Commission got hung up on this extended stay um, and wondering actually how that operates versus the residential. And I did a little bit of research, and what I turned up is that sort of by definition, I think extended stays are anything more than five days. And, and I guess maybe there's less requirements for what you have to have on site in terms of communal services, but actually you have to have kitchens and extended stay, which you do. But is there, I, I'm, not, I don't, I'm, I'm not saying we should build anything into this in terms of requirement, but is the intention to do 30 day or more extended stays or? Uh, so the way I operate currently is I've had actually, because the hotel business went down the tubes about two years ago, <laughs> Um, I actually started converting hotel rooms in, to have, have uh, kitchenettes because we, what we saw was, was people wanted to be isolated from other people. They didn't want the community areas. And so to try to fill the need, I added the kitchens and, and put the kitchenettes in and found that there was a, there was a need for this, this kind of transition type housing. Uh, the way we do it is, yeah, I put, I put on Airbnb, VRBO. I do minimum stays currently of four days actually. So I, I, I didn't know it was five days to be honest. Um, and I get, and it basically you have less house cleaning, less bra, less turnover. Um, you je generally will always have, you know, got to have the microwave, you got to have a stove top, you got to, you know, a toaster oven, whatever it is. You do a nice little kitchen with people, a nice refrigerator, a larger refrigerator, so that people can actually put their food, keep their food, and, and stay longer and feel comfortable. Okay. Um, that, that's how I, I have now. Now the, the issue comes is that the, the funny thing is ho the apartment units have more value than the hotel rooms do. And so what happens is in the hotel business is I have to kick people out on the 28th day because if they go to the 30th day, they fall under rent control under the under the eviction rules. And so it changes the whole format of how a stay works because now you need a lease agreement. And when somebody comes and stays in a hotel room, all they give you is a credit card. Maybe you have a light, you check them with a license, you take their credit card, but you don't have all the terms that would, would be necessary to keep a guest long term. Whereas when you take a lease agreement, you want to you, you basically do a credit application. You want to make sure the person's got a job that they're because what ends up happening is, you know, unfortunately in the community today is, is what we're seeing is probably a, a, a great deal of people that are in evictions um, and, and need, you know, it, 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 it's, a, it's, a, you know, it's something you have to address. You, you don't have a choice in the matter. I mean, I've had people move into an apartment, never pay rent, and it, you know, nine months later, <laughs> nine, nine months later, that was the unfortunate situation was we had to go through the process. And nobody wants that. Okay, thank you, I appreciate that. Stephanie. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for the presentation. Just two quick questions building on what Supervisor Rice said. Um, on the EVs, just a, a, a thought, which is to, so, some multifamily uh, builders are just putting in the electrical capability to, to later come in with EV chargers at all the, at all the stalls, uh, just putting in that uh, uh, electrical wiring. So, so that's one thought uh, for the future. But my question is, um, would you, what you're building here in terms of the apartments, would, would you call these sort of micro units? Yeah. That, yeah. Uh, we call it affordable by design. Yeah. So the idea is that these, you know, I, my, I, have, a, I have studios that have just rented for 3000 a month. These units would never rent for that. They're, they're sitting in the, you know, 1700 1600 I have employees that I lose all the time because they can't afford to live here. I lose managers. I lose staff people. It's like I can't keep people on staff at the hotel because they can't live here. And so at least getting, getting into something where you're in that $1,500, $1,700 range, it, it opens the door in an area that doesn't, doesn't, doesn't afford it. Thank you. Thank you. Other questions? No. Yeah. No, and thank you. You've kind of defined extended stay in your terms, which is five to 28 days, it sounds like. Yeah. So thank you. And I, and I do think that's providing housing for short term, certainly. Mr. Mr. Smith. Thank you very much, Supervisors. Uh, my name is Todd Smith. I'm the attorney for the Applicant O'Donnell Financial Group. Hopefully you can hear me okay. Sorry if I get my glasses out. Um, I, I think Dan did a terrific job. I think that the um, staff has done a terrific job sort of defining this project and presenting the legal issues to you as you need to understand them as you enter to a vote. I don't want to um, belabor it. I know you guys have been here all day, so I'm going to actually do a very shortened version <laughs> of my presentation and hopefully you'll appreciate that. Um, essentially, I'm here to urge you to uh, adopt the staff's 
alternative recommendation, which is the recommendation to approve this with the condition of the affordable housing agreement. Um, and before I get into all the state density bonus law nuance, which I do want to go through fairly quickly just to make sure the board understands exactly what are concessions, what are waivers, and why they've been requested here, I did want to talk briefly on that affordable housing agreement. The density bonus law actually requires that affordable units be subject to uh, an agreement which limits into at least 55 years. Here, the offer is in perpetuity. So the confusion at the Planning Commission didn't really take into account that there's actually a state law mandate that says you have to have that agreement in place. We certainly invite the board to then make a, that a condition of approval. You know, it's a condition of law no matter what, so let's you know, bootstrap it and make it a condition of approval as well. The applicant's more than happy to enter into that agreement to remove any doubt about that particular issue. Um, I did submit a letter yesterday. I know it's late in the process, so if you didn't have a chance to review it, uh, I do apologize. We just wanted to make sure that we had time to review and digest the staff report. Um, as you well know, the state has a density bonus law to incentivize developers to add affordable housing. This county agrees with that because the county has its own inclusionary housing requirements. Um, the density bonus law is, you know, from a certain perspective, can be seen as probably a little draconian in the sense that it does strip a lot of the discretion that this board usually has in reviewing projects away. And so I want to acknowledge that, that this is a, these types of applications are unique for the board to have to consider. And I know that the public probably recoils at that sometimes because they're used to the board being able to, to more freely um, uh, push back and make requirements where under a density bonus law application project, it, it's far more difficult to do that. Uh, under the density bonus law, if you meet certain percentages, you get one, a density bonus, two, a certain number of concessions or waivers, or concessions or incentives, excuse me, as staff defined, uh, and then you can also request waivers from development standards. Here, because 20% of the resident, residential units are gonna be set aside for very low income housing, which is obviously a very hard area to achieve affordable housing in, uh, affordable housing is hard to achieve, period. Uh, there's a 50% density bonus on floor area ratio uh, for the residential component. You also then, if it's a mixed use development, are entitled to a 20% bonus on the commercial aspect. As uh, the, the planner said, the, the floor area ratio density bonus has been applied here, but it has not been maxed out. It's actually several thousand, a couple thousand uh, below on the residential, and, and I can't remember the exact number, but it's all in the staff report. I think about 1,500 square feet below for the commercial aspect of it. So the, the project applicant and the project designers have designed this to give themselves the opportunity to have the necessary housing to meet the density bonus requirements. Um, but haven't gone full scale and tried to max this thing, this, this thing out completely in respect to the site and the neighborhood. Um, so in addition to that density bonus, which is in, uh, the, the, app the applicant is entitled to as a matter of law, the applicant, because of the 20% dedication, is also entitled to three concessions. So the concessions that have been requested here, uh, are, so just to step back for a second, incentives and concessions are one category. And concession basically means there's a standard that we're requesting that you modify or in some cases waive. And here, we're simply, for these three, we're simply requesting that you modify them to allow for the project to fit more neatly. Uh, under density bonus law, again, the project is, is entitled to three concessions. And so the three concessions that have been requested are uh, relief or modification from uh, Tamalpais Area Community Plan Policy LU 331, which relates to building height. Uh, an extension from 25 to 30 feet. Uh, Multifamily design guideline policy DG20, which reduces windows and fenestration uh, on the east elevation, that's the elevation facing the freeway. And, and the reason we, they've requested, the project has requested that is you don't necessarily want a bunch of windows overlooking the freeway for both aesthetic purposes, but also health purposes, because the more access there is, the more particulate matter can, can accumulate. Um, and then there's also the, a request for a concession of multifamily design guideline policy, DG80, which is to reduce the tree canopies from 25 to 5%. You've seen the pictures of the project site. It's, it's, a, yeah, it's, 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 a, it's, a, it's a it's a parking lot, basically, that not uses a parking lot, so the tree canopy issue really isn't existent there. Um, then there's also two waivers, and waivers are required to be granted by a local government if the application of the standard would prevent, physically prevent the development of the project. So in this case, the two waivers being requested are a reduction of the open space requirement from 1,000 feet to uh, 1,000 square feet to zero, and then the parking standard. So I did want to talk about the parking standard because uh, the senior planner brought that up as well, and there were questions about parking. 
um, as Manny explained, uh, the density bonus law says that if you have a 20% dedication of very affordable units, you can only impose, or actually it's defined as studios in this case, um, you can only impose one parking spot per unit. So under state law, it preempts the local code of 12, uh, that would calculate 12 units per, per 12 parking spaces for the residential units. Um, we are then requesting a reduction of that 10, which would be required under state law, to eight because of the space constraints associated with the site. So that's the, the first waiver, and the other one, as I said, is the open space. Um, I did wanna, I, I already touched on the issue of the affordable housing agreement and that, you know, how that addresses the planning commission concerned, or the concern raised by the planning commission. I wanna commend staff in terms of their answers related to the record here. I think the mitigated neck deck was very well done. It found that there are no significant impacts. It specifically addressed issues of climate change uh, and sea level rise. And as Ms. Ms. Reed explained, CEQA constrains that. But nonetheless, in this case, the, the building will be lifted 100, one foot above uh, uh, the, the FEMA flood line, and therefore it's consistent with FEMA as well. So we think that issue is, is, has been addressed as well. Um, I'll leave it at that because I think everything has been said very well by staff and by Mr. Chador. Unless you have questions for me, I'll. Anything for Mr. Smith? No? Or the architect. Yeah, well, the architect's here as well. Could, could we have the architect speak to the ability to wire in the capability to add charging to the residential parking spots, at least two? What's his name? Benjamin Jones. Oh, Al, could we bring Benjamin Jones into the panel, please? I'm, I'm standing by trying to get okay. him video. Nice to have Hello. you here. Thank you. Okay, here we go. Perfect. Hello. Hi. Thanks for your time. Um, yes, I have drawings that will support um, some of the questions that, that have come up from the board members. If I could do a screen share, is that possible? Manny, could you allow a screen share, please? <clears throat> I have no way of sharing the screen. Mr. Okay. Jones, oh, I, you sure. should oh, yeah, be able to yeah. share your screen. Yeah, yeah, thank you. You know what? Yes, I can. Okay. Can you can you see that? Not yet. Okay, hold on. <clears throat> um, hang on. Can you see that? No. Al, can you assist them, please? Let's see. Mr. Jones, when you click on share screen, Mm -hmm. uh, it will give you the option to decide which monitor you want to share. Just select the one that you want to share. Right now, we're not seeing anything. We're seeing you. Okay. So let's. Okay. Here we go. How's that? There you go. Excellent. Awesome. Thank you. Okay, so um, I did have um, uh, 20 drawings uh, ready to show to the board, just to give you a sense of what the project's about. It's always good to understand um, what you're what you're trying to to uh, to approve. I'm um, I'm wondering if you could actually sort of fast forward to the parking and the and just to answer my question around the potential. Yes, absolutely. Here's um here's the first floor plan. If you see where my cursor is, there are three EV spaces. Oh, so they are they are they are already built in. Yes. Okay, so that's on the and that's on the the residential side or. Um, those would be accessible for for both, probably for hotel and residents. Okay, all right, great. Mm -hmm. Thank you, and Mr. Jones, Perfect. I don't want to cut you off. So if there's something else you wanted to share, but if you can um, just be quick, that we'd appreciate uh, it. Yes, I'll be very quick. Thank you for your time. Um, this project, we've been working together for three years. Um, we've gone through, as Manny described, um, numerous uh, refinements, working with Cam Valley Design Review Board. And what the final product we have is, is it's without question, it, it's a great amenity um, and it, to, the, to the community. It's a gateway into Cam Valley and it will remove the blight um, after 25 years of a vacant lot and provide much needed housing. Thank you, Mr. Jones, really appreciate Thank it. Thank you. So 
So any questions remaining of staff or the applicant or Mr. Jones? Uh, Supervisor Moulton Peters, thank you. Just one last question, and that is uh, if well, I could get clarification of the role of the Planning Commission in this particular case. There was some discussion about being advisory to, uh, to the board in, in this particular matter. If uh, Tom could respond to that. Uh, yes, happy to, Supervisor. Master plans um, are types of approvals that only the board has decision-making authority over. The Planning Commission serves an advisory um, capacity. This is unlike other lower levels of permits, for example, design review, where the Planning Commission could be the ultimate decision-maker and their decision can be appealed. But master plans fall in the category um, of um, recommendations, just like um, a rezoning or a general plan amendment. These are a very small subset of um, permit types or decisions where the commission serves in advisory capacity and the board is the ultimate decision maker. Thank you very much. So I'm gonna bring it back to the board. Wondered if Supervisor Moulton Peters, you had a recommendation going forward? Yeah, I do. I'd like to make a few comments and then a recommendation. Um, you know, uh, this is uh, yeah, a site I'm familiar with and it's, it has been vacant and, and, and frankly, uh, blighted for a long time and uh, you know we do need housing we do need affordable housing uh, we do need hotel space too for recreational use uh, this is environmentally it's it's a disturbed site it's been it's been cleaned up of course but um, you wouldn't call it pristine uh, it does not fall within the Baylands corridor although it does have great access to open space uh, and, and outdoor hiking trails. Um, it is a uh, transit-oriented site, as the applicant has said, and that's a good thing, plenty of options there. And then it's uh, walkable to local shopping and restaurants and really everything you need, drugstores. Uh, there was quite a discussion uh, at the Planning Commission about uh, sea level rise and flooding, and I think that's valid. Uh, our our CEQA um, staff expert uh, has explained that CEQA itself doesn't address that, but I, I can say tell you that our county vulnerability uh, study has identified uh, this area uh, for future uh, evaluation and work uh, because of flooding and sea level rise. And I can also share that as of this year, Caltrans has identified the whole corridor uh, from Manzanita Town Valley down to Donahue Exit in Marin City for study as a future sea level rise project. And I, I raise this because the solutions to flooding and sea level rise in this area are really gonna be area wide, not parcel by parcel. And so uh, while I, you know, I know there's concern about flooding and sea level rise, I, I think these things uh, can be addressed, will be addressed. I've seen the site function in the way that you described it as there is access going out through Miller Avenue. So uh, there will be certain days where there isn't access. We had a, the, one of those days recently. But for, for all of these reasons, I, I think this is a good project. I think it satisfies a number of needs. I think it's well designed after the work that the Design Review Board did on it. Uh, and so I would propose that we uh, adopt the proposed mitigated neg deck and approve the O'Donnell Financial Group Master Plan Agreement and Design Review application with a condition of approval to enter into the affordable housing agreement paid for by the applicant. So that's Thank my, you. yeah. And I'm happy to, to second that as well. And can I make one quick comment? You can, yeah. Yeah, um, I, I think that I, I'm, I'm hoping given, given what we know about the area and the flooding that happens during king tides and during storm events, nearby and cutting off that access, wh which you acknowledge, and which actually doesn't just impact people or who live, who may be living near that intersection on-ramp and off-ramp, but also all of Tam Valley, something worth disclosing to future tenants um, um, if this goes forward, your residential tenants as well as, as, well as the um, uh, folks who stay in the extended stay. And then also I just wanna, um, I, I think I heard this, I just wanna confirm if, if indeed ever there's an interest in the property owner to come back and convert the yeah. extended stay into residential, they, or they do have to, would have to come back to our board, I believe. Tom, yes? Tom, I see you, your name. <laughs> 
maybe not. Uh, if, if I may, I, I think I brought this up earlier, uh, Supervisor Rice. Um, yes, that, that is correct. <clears throat> your, your board would maintain absolute control over that and it would be subject to whatever affordable housing laws are in place at the time your board took it up again. Perfect, thank you. Thank you. Any other comments? I, I would just add, and I think the motioner and the second would would uh, uh, include this or have included this, that we'd be directing um, staff to come back with a revised resolution related to our decision today. So if you accept that, we'll go Thank forward you. with uh, motion. Okay. If, if I may, um, to the president, uh, did, did we take public comment on this? I don't think we did, yeah. Thank you. We're lacking public in the chamber, so I didn't uh, remember. So any public comment on this item in the chamber? And it looks like we have some people on Zoom. So thank you, Brian Case, for reminding me. Al, could you invite the people on Zoom in to make public comment, please? Yes, yeah, so the first speaker is Janet, followed by Clay, Clayton Smith and Bupin Amin. Janet, please unmute, and you have the option to share video. Janet, please unmute, and you have the option to share video. Janet, we see you unmuted. Uh, however, we can't hear you. Janet, we'll come back to you. The next speaker is Clayton Smith. Please unmute, and you have the option to share video. I'm probably more familiar with this uh, particular property than anyone having um, had an office there for, um, oh, I don't know, my wife has been there, I think, uh, all of 40 years in the building next door. Uh, when you refer to the flooding, uh, that is probably one of the most difficult and, and most flooded intersections in the Bay Area routinely. And the, uh, to say access to Miller Avenue is actually to say access vis-a-vis uh, -vis East Blythdale, which itself is one of the worst um, uh, 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 roadways uh, to get on the freeway, particularly when you've got the, a lot of rain going on. Manzanita across the street, when flooding occurs in that intersection, Manzanita and the bu bus traffic that is associated with it is 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 not in service during that period of time. So they, there is no bus traffic there during flooding. Um, the idea of blight, you know, the blight I found on this property happened as a consequence of the last few years. It was basically a parking lot. And this uh, O'Donnell group uh, let uh, turned this over to being a dump yard for construction people. And it was a disaster of appearance for this, the neighborhood we live in. It was really the most ill-treated piece of property in all of Southern Marin and it went on for two or three years. I went up to the Civic Center, complained about it and everyone up there that I talked to in the building department pretended they knew nothing about the property and it's almost impossible to find on the property ledgers. I also would like to indicate that this, the traffic in this location is horrific on the weekends when we're having our beach traffic. It's, a, it's, a, it's really one of the most congested intersections in the Bay Area. Thank you, Clayton. The, um, <clears throat> the time's up. Thank you. The next speaker is Bupin Amin. Please unmute, and you have the option to share video. Very good. Thank you for uh, for the time. Um, to echo my uh, my neighbor's comments that uh, the property has largely been uh, been ignored over the years and uh, in terms of a storage yard is the reason a lot of the the, the issues that have been discussed um, arose but uh, but more importantly I, I I strongly feel that um, that the developer is taking advantage of of kind of misconstruing the uh, the ordinances um, basically by designating of the 20 units which would otherwise require four um, affordable units um, 20 percent um, they basically indicated that only 10 of them are quote apartments and the other 10 are quote extended stay um, hotel rooms um, and therefore only having to provide two units 
one of which they've already indicated um, they're gonna have an on-site manager. And so really it's providing one net unit to the entire community um, in exchange for a massive slew of, of variances and concessions, including a complete ex uh, uh, exception to the open space requirement, a, a larger um, height requirement, a lack of parking, which is a major problem for, for the, the area, the restaurant, the hotel um, already lack parking um, to, to provide less parking for a, a, a property that's likely gonna have most people in Marin County, as we all know, two people are gonna have two cars. That's just a reality of where we all are with two cars and 20 units are gonna have 40, 40 cars potentially in that area with already a shortage of parking and task for an a additional exception, I think is unwarranted here. Again, the only exchange being offered is one affordable unit to the entire community. I think this is a play on words and this is not something that, that benefits the community nor is something that, that deserves these, these types of waivers. Um, and I think that's where the Planning Commission and the Design Review Board are both um, suggesting that this, this project, everyone agrees it's a pretty pretty building, but it's just the wrong place. Sea level rise is real. Um, to to CEQA doesn't address it, and I think it's our responsibility and and the board's responsibility as our elected officials to make sure things like that are addressed before we make the problem worse by approving buildings that really don't belong in that that location, oversized and underparked, which really just leaves a problem for future generations. Thank, and, and thank future you. Residents. Your time's up. Thank you. Thank you. The next speaker is Janet. We're coming back to you. Please unmute, and you have the option to share video. Jan, it looks like you're still having difficulties with your audio. Please disconnect and reconnect, and we'll uh, promote you again. Uh, the next speaker is caller with telephone number ending in 689. Please unmute. Hello? Yeah, we can hear you. Oh, hey, uh, this is uh, Ricky. Caller with telephone number ending in 689, please unmute your device. Ricky, please hold on. Uh, the next speaker is Alan Jones. Please unmute and you have the option to share video. Al, um, Alan Jones asked that we would bring in Douglas Wallace at the same time. I believe they're from the design review group. So could you do yes, that, please? That, that's possible. Uh, uh, Douglas Wallace and I both represent the TAM Design Review Board, and we'd like to appear together. Uh, is that possible? We're going to try and do that. So We're promoting Mr. Wallace. Uh, please stand by. So why don't you go ahead, Mr. Jones, and start thank, your presentation. Thank you very much. I, I have to say just procedurally, I'm disappointed that these comments, uh, that you've already made your motion before hearing these comments. But... Uh, nevertheless, I'm Alan Jones. I'm an architect and current chair of the TAM Design Review Board. Uh, we've explained our rather complex history in regard to this project in a letter, which I hope you've all read, and also made reference to specific provisions of the TAM and Pius Area Community Plan, which we would have likely considered in our evaluation. I won't cover that ground except to repeat that it came back to us for a review with the master plan. Had it come back to us, we would have likely rejected the application. The Planning Commission is to be commended for conducting a very thorough and thoughtful review during the course of which a wide range of views and perspectives were carefully considered. They were not confused. They were very deliberate. I urge you to support their findings. The architect's renderings show a proposed building which is not unattractive. What is not clear from the drawings is how massive it will appear in relation to the surrounding buildings. It's large rectangular block, all the more massive because of the requirement that it be raised above the surrounding floodplain. I ask you to visualize this structure in place and then to imagine the questions in the minds of everyone passing by on their way to Tam Valley, Mill Valley, and West Marin. I would suggest they might be saying, how the heck did the supervisors allow such a massive building just yards away from where the highway already floods 10 or 12 times a year? You're being asked to make concessions in exchange for only two units of affordable housing. 
I recently helped a neighbor get approval to build a second unit in her backyard. And I promise I'll persuade another neighbor to do the same. Then we'll have two units without the cost and the risk. Thank you. Thank you, Alan. Sir Wallace, go ahead. Yes, thank you for your time, members of the board. I, I'm afraid that the um, approval of this project would require a real ex exercise of optimism about future conditions. We know that sea level rise is inevitable. We know that it's accelerating. All the discussion of parking is somewhat moot when you consider that those parking spaces will be inundated for much of the time, or at least to imposing extreme inconvenience on the residents and users of the facility. This will only get worse over time. So I, uh, sure, they're, they're elevating the building by a few feet, but it's worth remembering that the FEMA standards are outdated and, and already in, in need of updating. Um, I would urge the board to really think this through carefully and avoid making decisions now that commit us permanently to protect, protecting a, a, new, a new facility, a new building, and imposing those costs on the public when this site could be put to other uses, including letting the wetland migrate uphill, upslope, as it would normally do if this, this, uh, this, this property were left to that use. So these, these future costs on the public are disturbing. And also, I believe that the Bay Conservation and Development Commission will be required to permit this as well. It's the sort of the last bite of the apple, so to speak, on permitting. I would really hope that the Board of Supervisors not just leave it to, in, in recognition of, of the threat of sea level rise, which is very well known in this county, I would hope the Board would not just put this in the, drop this in the lap of the BCDC to reject this project. It is a, a, a fine project. It's in the wrong location. Thank you. The next speaker is Ricky. Please unmute and you have the option to share video. Hello. Go ahead, sir. Yeah, hey, uh, so my family has been operating the hotel, which is uh, across the street from 155 Shoreline Highway for uh, the past few decades. And as Brooklyn uh, earlier brought up the topic regarding parking, uh, uh, which we see as a big issue as well. I mean, uh, everybody at a location comes by a car. They do not come by taxi or bus. I mean, we have, it depends on the location, location-wise, airports and all those kinds of places where people would come in a taxi. And um, for that location, we've always had people come in cars, so that would be a big issue. And the other issue um, I think the board needs to um, take in consideration is they're claiming they will be using some of the apartment units as hotels, uh, putting it on Airbnb and uh, uh, VRBO. Um, but the county right now, as far as I know, they're still not regulating those uh, types of bookings and they're not collecting taxes. So basically they would be operating those units as a hotel and not collecting transit occupancy taxes like um, we would for the hotels. And I think that's one of those things I would want you guys to consider as well. I think it was, I think that, that's about it. Thank, Thank you. you. The next. The next speaker is caller with telephone number ending in 689. Please unmute. Okay, can you hear me now? Yes. Yes, we can hear you, go ahead. Okay, good, thank you very much. My name is Janet Weiner. I own the building uh, directly uh, right across in, in, of the parking lot that, that we're all discussing here. And my, I have several points here, but I'll get to the chief ones that I am really surprised to see in here. Their, their property, if I'm not mistaken, includes a set of beautiful trees in the back there, which appear that they're going to take out to build this building. Further, I don't know how they go from reducing the required open space from 1,000 square feet to zero square feet. How does that work to give them more? No, this is like, this is like playing games with square footage in FAR. I, don't, I think it would be a catastrophe uh, for those trees to go. They're beautiful trees. They've been there a very long time. They're very large. They provide, you know, habitat for birds. They provide shade in the summer. They're quite lovely. And I have no idea how they're being allowed to take them out. Outraged. And I have to agree with Clayton, whose wife has been in, in, the, in the area for 40 years. I've owned this building for 20 years. And I can, I can categorically tell you that I have never had a flood in my building. Not once. Not even close. 
guy that built my building, he was a Dutchman. He came over from Holland after World War II, and he built it right. He built it just six inches higher. Finally, I would like to say that I think it's outrageous to have this height and this size of this building there. It's going to make everything else look look, look dwarfed and, and um, pathetic by comparison. It is not in keeping with the neighborhood at all, at all. And actually, I could say one more thing, too, in responding to what other people said about the um, – the not, we all know about the regulation of VRBO and B, Airbnb uh, tenants. And I can assure you that we're going to create a, a crime situation in that in that area with having these transient people coming in and out because they've got nothing vested in it. People that live in the neighborhood have or have offices in the neighborhood. They have a vested interest in keeping it nice and watching out for each other. We all watch out for each other. But you have transients running through there. It's going to be a nightmare. Finally, and no one has brought this up, the, the – uh, Getting in and out of that driveway. You had another 40 thank, cars. Thank you. Your time's up. Thank you. Okay. The next speaker is Ivy Louie. Please unmute, and you have the option to share video. Hi. <clears throat> Hi thank you. Um, as a Bay Area resident, I do travel into Marin County quite a bit. Um, my background is hotel, um, in the hotel industry, and um, I've worked locally in the area. Uh, as Janet pointed out, <laughs> kind of she added, she kind of began a discussion that I was going to discuss, which was the Airbnb situation. So you've got a mixed use of land where you've got apartments and you've got a non-branded extended stay hotel. Branded extended stay hotels already have challenges. Um, with a lot of foot traffic, just like Janet had explained. When you have a mixed use of Airbnb and you're utilizing apartment complexes as well as a non-branded extended stay hotel, that creates a lot of security issue and safety issues, not only for the, for the, for the guests that are staying there, living there, but for the local community. So what it's doing is, again, what Janet explained was it's inviting unwarranted foot traffic. As we all know, in the news recently, Airbnb has had a challenge with a lot of security issues. I can state in Orinda, there was an Airbnb situation where there was a party, there was shooting in Orinda, there, I mean, there was a lot of foot traffic. It was a nightmare for local law enforcement. Um, recently in Fairfield, there was an Airbnb incident where there were guests that were renting um, a house in a very nice neighborhood in Fairfield and their van tires were slashed and they were frightened because they were out of town wanting to go and to travel into probably the area, maybe Napa wine country. My big concern is the security issue here with Thank the you. folks Your that are going to be up. safe. Thank you. The next speaker is Vicky Chong. Please unmute. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, go ahead. Hi, yes, my name is Vicky, and I'm a local resident who's also disappointed that a motion is being done without any regard to the people. I regularly exercise on the trails, so I witness the sea level rising and the impact it has on the area. The property you're trying to build is literally on the sea level. CEQA standards do not properly account for this analysis yet, but that doesn't mean that a community does this, doesn't deserve a full evaluation before approving any development plans for this ecologically sensitive area. I strongly believe that a full environmental impact report is required, given the tremendous long-term impact this project will cause. Please take into account the majority and not just the few that will benefit with this project. Thank you. The next speaker is Eva. Please unmute. Thanks so much. Um, I think I may know this area better than anyone and more intimately um, as a forever cyclist um, who grew up in the area and still uses the bike path there. And I can tell you that the, the flooding issues are really, really serious. Independent of this particular project, I want to urge um, the kind of back and forth between uh, 
amongst everyone in Marin um, to look a little more deeply at this issue. We're talking about the flooding, but the flooding is not independent of climate change. And then we have people calling in and saying, well, no, but it's just standard to have two cars. Well, it is standard to have two cars. And in, in a lot of Marin families, it's standard to have more than two cars and it's killing us. And we can't keep going on like this. There's a serious problem with how we're living. And so, you know, while this project is extremely limited, um, you know, it's, it's also stunning that, that, that you would be pressured into doing this for two units of affordable housing. But there are a lot of shortcomings with this project. But the, the, the larger issue is we're not really grappling with how we failed to address car culture in Marin in, in spite of our, you know, supposed environmental credentials, we're so worried about the, the grasses growing on the bottom of the bay, but we don't care about the, the emissions we're putting into the air. Even, even the electric cars that you guys are making a lot of you know, fuss about, these are not that great of an environmental solution. We need to rethink mass transit. We need to rethink building, and I know it's painful for people to think about that, but we do need to rethink building. This is not a great location, but it does raise really critical uh, questions about how we're addressing, or rather how we're not addressing climate change and transportation. Thank you. The next speaker is Tanya Condi. Please unmute, and you have the option to share video. Hi, thank you for your time. My name is Tanya, I'm the general manager of the uh, Holiday Inn Express right there in Middle Valley. And I'm just gonna be super brief. Uh, parking, it's already an issue. Uh, it gets really busy. And I mean, I'm there six days a week. It is already an issue. I feel like um, we are, um, or that spot, it's already at its capacity. So I don't see this building. I, I just I just can't even imagine it. It's, um, I mean, two weeks ago when we had the heavy rain, it, it got crazy over there. Um, it was very hard to, uh, to get in or exit, you know, that the, the, the bus couldn't even come through. So I just, I just can't even imagine it. Thank you. The next speaker is Janet. We're coming back to you, Janet, please unmute. Janet, it looks like you continue to have issues with your audio. Uh, the next speaker is Herman Jimenez. Please unmute. Hi, my name is Herman Jimenez, and I am an area resident who also works in Middle Valley. Uh, this project is not entitled to all of the density bonuses and exceptional salt here. They're offering two units of affordable, uh, affordable housing, one of which will likely go to a resident manager. That means the community gets one new affordable room in exchange of waivers to high parking, FAR, trees, and open space. I don't think this project should be approved. This should be denied. That's all I want to say. President Rodani, uh, there are no additional speakers mm -hmm. in the queue. Thank you, Al. I'm going to bring it back to staff to see if they have anything they want to add after hearing public comment. Tom? Yes, thank you, President Rodoni. I have a few comments and then maybe my uh, colleagues will join in. I wanna first respond to the last speakers um, and a few other folks uh, who have spoken about um, how low the threshold is to trigger the density bonus. Um, the issue here is not the county's code. The issue is the state law. The county has a very high inclusionary requirement of 20%. By compliance with that 20% requirement, residential projects automatically trigger the state density bonus law. That's not the case in other jurisdictions that may have a lower inclusionary requirement. So I wanna just clarify that, you know, this is not um, an applicant, um, you know, taking advantage of county rules. This is an applicant relying on what our legislators have written into state law as state density bonus law. And then the, a few other things I wanna comment on. I know Supervisor Rice had questions about the EV charging requirements. And while I wasn't able to connect with our chief building official, um, I do recall a few years ago in the update of the, green, of the building code, 
uh, we did put in requirements for EV charging infrastructure for residential and non-residential developments. So um, at the appropriate time, I might suggest some language for the board to consider. I know we don't have a resolution for your board to, to, uh, to ratify today since, um, since we're bringing forth the planning commission's recommendation. Um, but uh, should your board direct us to come back with the resolution granting approval, I do have some suggestions on how to address the EV charging requirement. Um, I also heard affordable housing agreement uh, which will also address, I think, well, another one of the commenters' concerns that the operator will just uh, turn the residential units into short-term rentals, you know, and rent them out through Airbnb or VRBO. That won't be possible because 